Um, thank you for coming. This is a large block of time. I understand people will be coming and going. I do not take offense at that because there are other things going on in parallel. Um, the slides um, and the paper actually associated with this are on the, my website. So you go to coalong.com, all the stuff I presented yesterday and I presented today is already available. Plus, I finally caught up in my blogging and related to that on my blog, I have this post um, uh, on Alexander, Riddle, and Churchman, which is really part of the driving force behind all of this. Uh, so today's topic is actually um, oriented as a workshop. So yesterday, uh, slideshow, start, there we go. So today's agenda is exploring the context of pattern languages. Uh, yesterday I gave a talk, um, the middle slides, uh, the middle section is the same in both, but yesterday I covered the theory which was on multi-paradigm inquiry and why I'm doing this and so the, the radical stuff. Today is the more practical one and the purpose is to have a dialogue on the world around Christopher Alexander and I'm very happy uh, that Max Jacobson is here because this is actually a lot of history of science and then extending beyond that. And um, uh, he will validate or change what I'm saying, which is really good. Uh, because um, a, a lot of this is around Christopher Alexander's work. And so generally, my experience, and I think a lot of people's experience, is that Alexander wrote so much, there's a lot to read, there's a lot to catch up on. Um, but in addition to that, there's a world around Alexander that is evolving at the same time. And so the uh, part of the reason for my focus on this is that this morning's talk was interesting by Yodan because he's focused very much on physical places. But if you look in the mid-1990s, the software development community came in and started working on, um, on pattern language. And then you have a question, do things that are done in physical spaces apply when you are in software development? And this conference, Purple Sock, which has social change in its title, does that mean that what Alexander was doing is relevant to social change, or do we need to change things and look at things a little bit differently? So what I'm going to do is, um, is go through some of this content, and, then, and it's in three sections, um, what is the context of pattern languages? And I'm going to present seven different <coughs> dichotomies, dialectics, I'm going to just show it, just flash them at you, uh, because that is a discussion point we'll do in the third part. And so um, if people want to um, check out and come back later, and, uh, I'm recording the discussion here on digital audio. It'll be available for everyone afterwards. Um, I blog this. So um, I'll have to put the question up front. I'll talk about the paradigms that went from the 1960s through the 2010s, through the current days on generative pattern language. And then um, uh, we'll have a lot of discussion, open discussion. So uh, people that want to um, interject, uh, please feel welcome to do so. And I'm sure Max will, so. <laughs> okay, so. Sorry, one yes. I, I guess I missed this. Do you also share your slides? Yeah, yeah. The, sl the, the, slide, the slides are on coevolving.com. Uh, for those of you who do not yet have a bookmark, please take a bookmark. It has coevolving.com if you can't remember it. Um, so these are the the um, dialectics that I am going that we should discuss at the end. Um, so problem seeking versus problem solving, uh, wicked problems versus solution to a problem in context, the idea of multiple perspective inquiry as opposed to a culture unselfconscious or self-conscious, normative methods of social organization versus descriptive me measures of physical space. Ecological qualities outside and between, as opposed to objective qualities inside, this starts getting down into philosophy um, fairly rapidly. Uh, resilience, collapse, and transformation against order, wholeness, preserving, and disrupting. And the last one, uh, interactive value constellations versus the feeling of connectedness and living structure. So the purpose here is that there is no one right answer. Uh, for, for each of us doing research, we end up making decisions about these sorts of things. And so when you come at it, what I do with my research may be different from what you do in your research. And so my uh, offer to you is to help you try to understand the assumptions that are in your own research. 
And it makes it easier then for people to have discussions about, well, so, so as I was saying before, I tend to not work in physical spaces. Um, so if you take my career at IBM, we made an art of working remotely, and so I was one of the people, I, I had, did not have an office, I had an office between 1985 and 1991, and then from 1991 to 2012 when I retired, I never had an office. So everything was remote. So when you start talking about that, it's kind of like, okay, well, what is the interaction that's happening? Can you actually use pattern language? Does it make sense to do that? That's a different context. So that's the uh, challenge at the end. And um, this is from Ian Mitroff, who was one of West Churchman's um, students. And so he was also at Berkeley at the same time that Max at Berkeley and everybody else. Uh, and he's come up with this idea um, in this book. Um, he uses this quotation by Timothy Pinchon, if they can get you asking the wrong question, they don't have to worry about the answers. And this is unfortunately the era of Donald Trump, uh, where they had you asking the wrong questions. Uh, but from statistics, normally we talk about errors. And so there's a type 1 error, a false positive. So if you're doing a drug test, as an example, if you do a drug test, it's possible that you get a, a, a false positive. It work, you say it works, but it actually doesn't work. It's possible you get a false negative. You think it doesn't work, but it is working. Right? There's the type 3 error, which has been described by many as solving the wrong problem precisely. <coughs> Ian has re-portrayed that as tricking ourselves. Unintentional errors of solving the wrong problem precisely, and this could be through ignorance, through faulty education, or unreflective practice. So you have your students going and working on this problem, and saying your students say, that's not the real world, it doesn't matter, it's just an exercise, I want you to focus on this problem, which is okay, but then if the students go and think, this little exercise is how you're supposed to approach the whole world, now you're in trouble. And the type 4 error, which I really like, is the tricking others, intentional errors of solving the wrong problems and misleading people. Now, this is a fear that I have within the pattern language community, where people say, we should be using pattern languages. It's like, why? Are we solving the wrong problem? All right, so um, one of the people that in the systems community, um, Elena Leonard, uh, who lives in Toronto, uh, was the life partner of Stafford Beer. And Stafford Beer created all these methods, including uh, viable systems model and integration, all sort of stuff. And people go to Elena and say, oh, we need to do a integration. Okay, well, a integration requires three days. It requires an exact number of people, like you know, 24 people, something like that. You have meetings, all these structured ways. If you do not have three days to do a methodology, this is the wrong method, right? And it's really great for Elena to do that because she can stand outside. She's inside the method, and she's a world expert on integration, but she can actually stand outside of that and say, if you try to do something different, then let's, let's just you know, call a horse a horse and let's do something different. So that's what I'm trying to do and with this exercise. Yes, go ahead. My is Andrew's Quintercastles. May I comment on the type three? Sure, there? go ahead. So when, uh, you know, try, I really appreciate Alexander and his colleagues at work, but um, one thing I'm noticing even here is that, um, uh, well, uh, in Takashi Iba's work, I spoke with him. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to collecting all kinds of activities and examples, and he talks to people, what's working for them. Yes. But I mentioned, and he, he I think, he agreed that, uh, you see, you can have a uh, very functional solution, but it may be a very dysfunctional world. Yes. So then is it functional? I think that's the problem. So it, it, all these things may be working, in the dysfunctional world, then are they just supporting the dysfunctional world? Or like, for example, you got have many good patterns for cards. You can have the best cards. Yes. So the question is, does the world need cards? Yes. So yes, yes. And, and, and within the systems community, I think that's handled a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually one of the focuses. So, so I'll get into that in a, in a moment. Okay. Okay. So we'll start right into the paradigms. Okay, so I showed this slide yesterday. Over 50 years, Christopher Alexander and his co-authors of all concepts and languages in the built environment. So I start off with no public form and went all the way through to uh, 2012 with the battle. And um, the interesting part to me, and, and for people who are not so familiar with, um, with Alexander, the, different, the change in terminology is really interesting. <coughs> and I think that people who start reading a single work think that that's the work of Alexander, but there's this longer arc. And I see him as a researcher who 
wrote what he knew at the time. So he was learning, and you need to appreciate that if they're a good scientist and they're reflective, they go, they go to a certain point and say, yeah, I used to call it that, but now I call it this. And they try to make that clear. So there's a problem when, when people come in and they focus on a pattern language as a single work and say, okay, now I understand pattern language, because it's like, well, you actually don't understand the bigger picture here. So when I, I have someone new coming to the, this community, I say, what you want to do is you want to start with the battle, because that's the latest work, and that's where the vocabulary is probably the most stable, but that doesn't mean you can't recognize other things. And speaking to some other people who have been here, and I've, I've spoken to them, they said, yes, that actually made a lot of sense, that someone actually did start there, and then went worked backwards, and they said, now it makes a lot of sense. But the sort of terms you get, so in 1964, in most of the sense of the form, you get process of design and goodness of fit, right? Uh, the, the talks are books, and these ones are articles, right? So, uh, in the city of Dodge Tree in 1965, they have your natural cities, for the, both the artificial cities, and the idea of semi labs comes up. Um, 1967 is Pattern Manual, and Max was there at the founding of the CES. Um, and then 1968, a pattern language which generates multi service centers. This is actually my favorite book of all of them um, because it is, um, in, a, in effect, a close relation to the pattern manual. Um, what happens is, in this book, there are uh, so multi service centers are placed uh, particularly in um, low income, transient neighborhoods. Uh, so there's study of the Bronx, there's study of uh, Hunt Point. A multi-service center is a place where they come in for mental health services, doctors, social housing, all these things. Now, it's very clear on the scope here. He said that he's not focused on the social, ar uh, ar social aspects of the uh, multi-service center. He's an architect, he's looking at the buildings. Now, he can influence how people are served. So, an example would be, uh, when someone comes in, you have a reception desk. Well, the idea was that you wouldn't have a reception desk because it creates too much of a formality, a bureaucratic situation. So, you want to have people come and check in. You want to have a, a place to recognize that people come and they know this to check in. But you might not have a desk there. You might have someone walk up with a clipboard instead. <laughs> So there's organizational aspects associated with it, but it's actually spatial. And so he makes that pretty clear. And the pattern language was good in differentiating between different spaces. So one was a uh, how do you design a, a multi-service center in a place that's right by a subway station or transit, as opposed to one that's remote that has parking lots. So do you need to put a parking lot in or not put a parking lot in, and you have a limited site. So, so I really like that one. It's, it's hard to get. Uh, still available. Um, the 1968, uh, this article, System Generating Systems, where we use the term systems as a whole and generative systems, and I'll come back and focus on this in a minute because I think this is quite important in seeing um, Alexander working through systems theory. Now, as a person that comes from the systems community, I think he would have benefited a lot more by talking to people more in the systems community, and the fact that he had Wes Churchman across uh, you know, just in the next building uh, if you had talked to him more, it might have changed the way that he worked on things. Um, 1975, oh, sorry, uh, 1975, the Oregon experiment, uh, organic order participation, he's built brochure up there. Um, you have the pattern language, time of way of building. Um, 1999, you have the origins of pattern theory, which was published in IEEE software, I believe. And this was a follow on from 1998 when Alexander came to the computer science conference, Uppsala, and he gave a talk. And that talk you can actually find on YouTube. Um, if you actually look and you're searching, you ought to find out that um, I have a blog post that does a difference between what he said and then what he published in his work. Because it starts off the same, and then by the end of the talk, what he's written is actually different from what he said. So there's some variances there. Um, 2002, 2005, nature order, people try to get their way through those. But one I would suggest that they look at is a 2003 paper called New Concepts of Complexity, a Scientific Introduction to the Nature of Order. That's on patternlanguage.com. You can download that one. Uh, the terms on fullness of value, recursive structure, objective measures of coherence come up there. There's a 2004 paper on sustainability and morphogenesis. Morphogenesis is a mouthful. Um, this is at the uh, Schumacher Institute, so um, looking for small planet sorts of things. And, and so there he's got an audience that's more in systems, 
And so his talk is oriented more towards systems. It, it's better understood there. Uh, generative codes. Um, this one word generative comes up, and I think that's an underplayed word within his work. Um, empirical findings on the nature of order, uh, life, wholeness. Um, and this is one of the plays. He actually says in this paper, in, the, in nature of order, he uses the term structure extending transformations. And he says, now I call it wholeness extending transformations. So here is an explicit place where he says, if you're reading that, I meant this, and I prefer to use this language now. So uh, when people get to the battle um, for life and beauty of the earth, uh, the reason I like um, that book in particular, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more later, is that um, I'm essentially a methodologist. And so I'm actually interested in what people do much more than what people think, particularly the collaborating on work. And so here's a real project. And what he does is he actually tells you what he did. And I have a chart later I'll show you where he steps actually through the steps that, uh, that he did at the Aichen campus. Right? Um, so uh, I really like that to, to be practical. Okay, so the three people um, I focus out at Berkeley, and again, Max was there. Churchman, Riddle, and Alexander uh, taught there. So Wes Churchman um, was a philosopher of science. His focus was in metrology, which is the philosophy of measurement. So he's very interested in measurement, which we think that Alexander might talk to a little more about that. Um, he came in and he joined uh, the, uh, the faculty at, in business and one of the founders of operations research. Um, and, and he was one of the people that was trying to move from the idea of operations research towards system sciences. Russ Acoff, who was his student, actually wrote an article uh, in Management Science that, that was talking about trying to change the field of management science to be system science. Um, he was the associate director of research uh, in a philosopher in Space Studies uh, Laboratory, which was, fought, which was NASA. And so Ian Mitroff and Richard Mason, who were the students, uh, did this work, and they have this book called The Subjective Side of Science. Uh, and the subjective side of science is about NASA scientists. NASA scientists are supposed to be objective. They're looking at rocks on the moon, and they're trying to figure these things out. But there's a subjective side to science. So how does that work? And so uh, what uh, Ian says is that he believes that scientists all have their own pet theories. And they should fight for their pet theories down to the last, you know, even when they're wrong, they should be fighting for it because that's the way that science works. You have this debate going on in science and how you manage that. Um, in 1981, he retired, and to 1994, he was teaching in peace and conflict studies. So he oriented towards trying to um, work on ethics in particular. Uh, Horace Riddle and Chris Alexander were hired at the same time um, by Worcester, who came into the faculty. Um, so, so, Max, exactly when were you at Berkeley? It was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I took courses from Horace. Okay. So he had just gone. So it must have been 64. <coughs> okay. 64, but I didn't get out for many years later. Okay, okay, okay. He was wonderful, Horace. Oh. Okay, so he was in 1963 hired. At, from 1974, he was both Berkeley and at uh, the University of Stuttgart. And, and in his obituary, he says that he didn't leave Berkeley, he flew back and forth. Right. So, uh, so Alexander came in 1963 into the College of Environmental Design. In 1967, co founded the CES, and the pattern manual is the charter of the CES. In 1998, he retired from the university. So, one of the things that I had, so Thor Mann um, was a teaching, he was a research assistant to Horace Riddle. And he's been on the LinkedIn forums and been on the Facebook groups. And so I, I asked him if I, I, I got his permission, because he said this, both Alexander and Riddle were part of what was time, at the time called the design methods movement architecture, worked and taught in the same buildings and did talk and were seen walking off together to have lunch together. Churchman was teaching in the business school a few minutes down the road on the way to campus. So these guys are actually all together for, you know, how many years, right? They're all on campus together. Of course, they're all have these separate research agendas. But for me, as I'm still a grad student, I haven't finished my PhD yet, um, I'm actually more interested, hey, Max, I find you incredibly interesting because you were a grad student under all these people. And so... The, the history of science here that I'm interested in 
is not necessarily each of these individuals, but is there synthesis across them so that different people have different orientations and might approach a problem in a different way? Right? So I'm not a literal Christopher Alexander person. I respect his work, but I'm, I may be working in a different domain. I am not an architect. I do not work in physical spaces. So, uh, in the systems approach, I would think that we have an open system of knowledge, and we should recognize um, the concurrent research that's going on. So I took the first chart and I shrunk it down, and what you'll see in the next seven charts is a mapping in time of different research that was happening at the same time. We start off around <coughs> Riddle and Churchman, and we move, and we'll move into stuff that's more current. So, before we do that, I want to give one slide for each of... Um, Firstly, uh, Alexander, then Churchman, then Riddle, just to make sure people are familiar with this. So this is an article in 1968 on system generating systems. Now this was done for an art project that was um, uh, funded by Inland Steel, and I blogged about it, and so it turns out that I got a response from the daughter of one of the people who sponsored the research. Uh, it was an installation, and he says, this idea, there's two ideas hidden in the word system. The idea of system as a whole, and the idea of a generating system. And this is one of the things I find in the pattern language community, and I'm very, very particular about words. I tend to not use the word pattern. I use the word pattern language. And actually, if you see me writing, I will try to almost always use the word generative pattern language, because the generative is part of what I think Alexander wanted to originally do, and people are creating a lot of things that are non-generative. If you look back in the history of, um, of the people that were in at the Hillside Group and what they were doing work at, um, on the C2 wiki that Ward Cunningham created, there was a discussion that I've now understood, because the book design patterns came out at the time at which software was being uh, developed. And I spoke to Ralph Johnson in 2014, who's one of the authors, and he says, it was actually a coincidence that the Hillside Group started at the same time as the design patterns book. Design Patterns book was written before they started doing all the work, and so the person that was actually central to forming the Hillside Group was actually Richard Gabriel. Because Richard Gabriel was being, um, so the, the history is, Gabriel was working for Sun Microsystems. Bill Joy was interested in Christopher Alexander's work, and firstly hired Gabriel to come in contact with Chris Alexander, and then afterwards was funding Alexander in the research on the nature of order. So you actually see, if you read closely, that the funding from Sun Microsystems and Bill Joy was behind the nature of order. Otherwise, he wouldn't, wouldn't have, I don't know, just reading into it, he might not have had the money to complete it, right? Well, I um, think there's also, uh, at that time, I wasn't there, but uh, from what I hear is that there's, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Christopher Alexander's ideas in the software community already. So yes. even if, uh, I think Rob Johnson, the was told me that he didn't read a pattern language when he was writing it. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, his patterns, but um, like uh, what Cunningham and Ken Beck, they certainly uh, had read yes. uh, pattern language. And, and, had, yeah. and other people also had the ideas, and I think also notes on the synthesis of form was very important in, in the uh, uh, under, well, in the ideas that we see now in computer science. Yes. So that was. Uh, yes. And, and so I, I was working at IBM with. Um, John Lacides, who's one of the Gang of Four, yes. and so even even there, so I was working with Ian Simmons, um, and and John was on Ian's team, and Ian was talking about, in effect, the issue about whether the design patterns book was generative or non-generative. Mm -hmm. So on the C2 wiki, there is a discussion um, by Jim Copelian, and Copelian says and he actually calls gamma patterns which means the, the pattern design patterns book, and he's saying that the gamma patterns are not generative. And he was trying to, so, so I can see the frustration, and when you read through um, Richard Gabriel's books, that's his frustration, is that he wants the pattern language to be generative, but he's not getting the message across in the same way that Alexander was not getting the message across. Max, do you have anything to add to that about generative? No? Okay. So, so, so the, the, and this is part of the issue, is that generative, when you go into systems theory and you start talking biology, so the, uh, the example, um, there's a recent book, book by Schumacher that looks at autopoiesis and architecture, <coughs> and he makes a distinction between autopoiesis and allopoiesis. Um, autopoiesis is pretty well known in the systems community with Maturana, Umberto Maturana, 
and it's used in knowledge management. Autopoiesis means self-generating. So a human, uh, so you get down to the biological level, the question is biology self-generating. Uh, and actually, Macharada in his work says that the people in knowledge management are doing all this stuff on autopoiesis. He says, these guys understand nothing of biology. That's got nothing to do with it. So within the systems community, you've got someone in biology saying that I'm focused on, on autopoiesis, and these people that are doing knowledge management doing autopoiesis, They've done, they've, they've done exactly the same thing the pattern language community has done. They said, oh, this is it. This is pattern language. This is what I'm doing. He said, that's not it at all. You don't understand it at all, right? Um, so that's where frustration is coming up around generative. Um, the alternative to autopoiesis, the other side, is allopoiesis. And the way... Allopoiesis. allopoiesis. Yeah, from the other... Generate through the other. Yeah, yeah. And so allopoiesis is um, described by Schumacher as a production line. So you have a factory, you have inputs, and then you have the output on the other side. So the, a car does not reproduce itself. You have parts, and then it goes through the factory line, and then ends up at the end, and you have a car. That is allopoetic, that is not autopoetic. So now you see, when you come down to this part, a generating system is not a view of a single thing, it's a kit of parts with rules about the way these parts may be combined. He's treading pretty heavily on systems theory, and I'd go and I would now challenge, does he really understand what's going on? Now, this is 1968, and I think the Schumacher book may be like 2014, 2013 in architecture, right? So that's a long time away. But the idea of kit of parts actually says allopoiesis, not autopoiesis. So we're down at that level of trying to now tease these sorts of things out. Um, so almost every system as a whole is generated by the generating system. And for him, the idea was that the language was a generating system. And this is the part where it's like, OK, I see where he's going. I don't want, I'm not into the philosophy of language. Um, he started to look at, um, at grammars and this sort of stuff and generating from language something real. Okay? That's the orientation. Now, this is helpful um, as a statement of trying to figure out where he's going and, and, uh, and the direction towards nature of order. In a properly functioning building, the building and the people in it together form a whole, a social human, human whole, which is a nice statement if you are a social scientist and you deal with both space and with social organization. But he's starting to now go over into it, and his, but his focus is the building system, um, and in the sense they don't generate holes at all. Okay, so the word generate is here. He's moving towards the idea of order, which is a systems idea that's pretty well understood there. We can discuss order, disorder, discuss, discuss entropy. Um, I don't see him use the word entropy. Um, so, so he's in this world, and I think that if we had a better discussion with the systems community, it would actually help some of the understanding of what's going on in here. But I do find this article um, really, really, really helpful. It's been republished recently in a book on uh, computational architecture or something like that. So it's, it's pretty good. Now, we have the systems approach. And the systems approach, um, I don't want to use the definition per se. Um, this is actually a later work by Wes Churchman. Because uh, a lot of people, a lot of the critics of the system approach think it's about a rational approach to management. And that you do everything through reason. Uh, what, in effect, he, uh, Churchman was saying was that a good systems approach should actually include not just the rational, but the non-rational. And in particular, morality, religion, and aesthetics. So here's when you start getting into divisions within the systems community. What system are you working on? Now, at least we have the benefit of, of some natural um, language like boundaries, system boundary. So when you're talking about the system boundary, are you talking about a system that includes just the uh, mechanical parts and the, you know, the, uh, the machine part, or do you have a system that includes the human parts? So if you have a system that includes both the human and the non-human parts, then you start bringing in morality, religion, and aesthetics, as opposed to just focusing on the business. Right? Um, so the, the reason that the, uh, the book System Approaches Enemies is actually an interesting work is that this comes from philosophy and you're looking at um, Hegel and looking at dialectics. And so what he says are the enemies of the systems approach are morality, religion, aesthetics, politics. But in order for you to be really authentic with systems, you have to embrace the enemy. Okay, so here's the challenge is embracing the things that are trying to destroy you. 
And that's the sort of thing that happens when you try to step outside the rational mind. Okay, the third one, uh, Dilemmas in the General Theory of Planning. This is Bertel and Weber, uh, 1973. Now, there's this term in particular in the design thinking community. And around Stanford um, and around IDEO, there's all this talk about wicked problems and solving wicked problems. The first thing is that any time I see an article that says we're going to solve wicked problems, they haven't read the definition of what a wicked problem is. And so it's actually up on Wikipedia. The 10 <coughs> points from this article actually are in a Wikipedia article. So when you're working on a wicked problem, let's figure out what a wicked problem is for you so you're going to solve it. So what um, Riddle was focused on was a general theory of planning. You could talk about architecture as planning a site. You could talk about management as planning an organization. And there was this whole thing in the design methods movement. Is design planning? And that sort of thing, that turns out, and there's a paper that I've been working on uh, for the related to thinking and design community uh, that will be published, because this argument is coming back again in the design community, because design, a, a, a master's in design is a new MBA, right? So they're trying to figure out what they're going to be, and the ideas of design method to come back, and we'll all return to this. So there are these properties of planning type problems, they call it wicked. Uh, we use wicked, meaning malignant, in contrast to benign or vicious or tricky. Uh, there's been some uh, articles, Rafael Ramirez has written an article about tame problems. So one of the questions that needs to be asked is, if you're looking at um, the general idea, the, the shortest definition of pattern language, which is solution to a problem in context. Okay, so what do you mean by a problem? Is it a wicked problem? If it is a wicked problem, can you use pattern language or not? So if you start off and say, this is a wicked problem, I see Max shaking his head. You want to comment on that? Uh, the idea was they are not wicked problems. Good. I'm going to quote you on that. I now have you on audio. Horst <laughs> Riddle did not agree. Horst Riddle didn't agree. Okay, so there we go. We have, we have the disagreement right there. So... Um, so but you said, oh, if you look at number three, it says solution, solutions to wicked problems. So they are not true or false, but good or bad. But they are solutions. Well, so you can have a good solution or a bad solution, but they're not a true or false one. I, 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 so I, okay, so the, the way he uses a solution here would be as a stage moving forward in the plan, right? So it doesn't, in, in effect, he says there's no definitive formulation that has no stopping rule. If there's no stopping rule, there's no solving the problem. You move from one problem where you fix one thing and then it breaks something else in the system. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what the language idea comes in. Yes. So you have one uh, intervention and that leads to other patterns. Yes, intervention would be a different, a better, probably a better term to be used. Yes, intervention would be a better term. Yeah. Um, every week of problems we consider some to another problem. And, and so, um, so the, the, the reason, I actually just added this slide because when I was put up the posters downstairs, I started realizing that people came and they go, oh, what's with the problem? Oh, okay, I need to do this because it, it, it should be clearer. So um, in the design thinking community um, and in the design community, so does, there is a design community of people who are trained in art schools and design schools. And then you have the design thinking community, which is the management people trying to do what they think the people do in the design school, right? And the problem we actually have happening now is in the design schools, they're actually thinking they should be doing what they're doing in the business schools, which is actually worse. Because if you are working as a designer, um, you work through this process. There's actually an interesting article that got published this last couple of months. Um, one of them uh, on YouTube, it was uh, Design Thinking is Bullshit. Um, the other one... <laughs> Uh, th but there's actually one, another one behind that, which is what is missing from design thinking? And what is missing from design thinking is critique. <coughs> Crits. Because if you are a designer, you build something and then you get criticized. And this is what you do in design charrettes and, and through that architectural practice. You build them. And so this morning we heard you build all these alternatives. You, know, you could build models, whatever you're going to do, and then you destroy them. The business people go, oh, no, well, you just want to find the solution, do that one. And you do it through you know, creating alternatives, doing that. So they do not have the critique that designers are trained in their practice to do. So when you get to a wicked problem, the question is, can you actually deal with that? Well, designers deal with wicked problems all the time because you end up having to build something material. 
And so if you are building a product, sooner or later that product is going to ship or it's going to get the project will get killed, right? So it's going to ship or it's going to get killed. So you do iterations, you keep refining it. Now, when people approach this um, from a management perspective, they're trying to do reorganization, and they think, oh, I'm going to find the optimal, and I'm going to solve that wicked problem. Well, no, you fix a problem at a point in time, and then something else is going to come back and bite you later. So this is, again, the domain around pattern languages. I see a lot of language around people, particularly in purple stock, who think they're going to solve wicked problems. And it's like, okay, have you read the definition of wicked problem? Do you understand what it's all about? Can we or can we not? And so it's an open question. I'm not saying that a pattern language will not be helpful towards doing that, but whether it'll solve, I don't know. So I would say you could address with the problems better with the pattern idea, because what it does is, um, so this, this thinking of having different forces that have to be balanced, it is, uh, makes it explicit that you have this complexity that you have to address. And yeah. then, uh, as I said earlier, if you do the intervention, you're not, you're not done yet. There's more things to do. Yes, yes. But forces is actually one of the concepts that when people start writing patterns, they don't do forces very well. It's difficult for them to understand what those are. Well, I know it's difficult. That's, that's why we're writing patterns. It's so difficult. But that's why I like patterns so much. It really, uh, if you are uh, practicing, you have a solution, I think you have to start writing down why this, what are the forces for this table. It's not that easy. Yes, yes. They are there, of course. And yes. You can also see which forces have not been resolved by some of the tables you see today. Yes, but yes. It's, uh, yes. That is, the, the, that, that is, I think, the, uh, uh, well, sure. the achievement that we do with, with writing patterns. And we're not doing all the uh, yeah. all theories, so yeah. it's really difficult to find all the, all the right forces. I, I agree, I agree. And, and I think, um, and, and for Peter, this may be something that we have to consider within the Organization of the Purple Sock Conference, which is one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this workshop was that there wasn't enough time in the program in effect to do some more educational stuff. And so, uh, so as an example, having an hour or two hours discussing forces, like that, that would be really, really valuable to people because it's there, but they don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. I think there are two, sorry, there are two reasons why I still like physicists on the nose for, not because of the method, of course, but the truth is, is one, the idea of fitness is written in there very well, which yes. is the example with the light bulbs going on and off, and I also think that the um, encapsulation of smaller problems and the system of forces is very well explained in there. I think that's kind of, well, in, in the final way of building it is explained in more detail as well, but yeah. And the concept is very relevant and it's not so simple. You are right, uh, we are already discussing it a little bit in an informal way. We started uh, to show that there is a big community for, but coming from different kind of disciplines. Yeah? Yes. So that was the first conference. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Now we have settled down a little bit yeah? uh, and some people moved out, other people moved in. Mm -hmm. yeah? but there is some common understanding now. Yeah, yeah. But we think in the next uh, step we have to come more together, not to be separated into different disciplines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's yes. the idea. We are thinking in two years from now what kind of different uh, conference we, we have to do because we're getting bigger and bigger. That's also a problem because then you can't discuss. Uh, then you have don't yeah. so, much, so much time for discussion. Yeah? But yeah. I agree with you. Yeah? Yeah. We have to find some commonalities to come together and to discuss from different standpoints yeah, the same issues like forces or other kind yeah. of stuff. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, so I organized the, um, the, a conference for the International Society for System Sciences. Um, and I had a one track I called the basics track. And, and what I did was I asked, actually I called up the ex-presidents. This is the, uh, like the 52nd annual meeting. And so we actually have like a lot of presidents and I think one of the things is that no one asked a, a president of the a old president to do something. But I actually did. I said, I want you to come and I want you to talk about stuff that you don't have to prepare for. Because you spent your whole lifetime teaching this. So I had Ian Mitroff come and teach about the design of inquiring systems, which for him is like, yeah, I could do that. I could do that standing on my head. It's like, of course you could do that. But for someone coming new into the community that doesn't understand the design of inquiring systems and churchmen's work, it's kind of like, I think you're missing something. But at the same time, it's like, when would you have an opportunity to actually interact with those people? 
So these conferences are valuable as education, I find, um, and bringing all these different people together. And it's not on the leading edge research necessarily. So we could ask some people to give very, very basic talks, and uh, I think that would be fruitful. Okay, so West Churchman. Okay, so this is the first one, um, first of the different paradigms and perspectives. And um, this starts in with the idea of architecture versus design. And we end up with this question, um, the design thinking community comes in, and they try to solve something, and it's like, okay, what are you trying to do? Um, if we go back, and this is before, um, or, well, 1964 is built on the census of Ford, but in 1969, there's a book called Problem Seeking, New Directions to Architectural Programming. And in that, uh, Pena and Folke, who were actually practicing architects in Houston, Texas, they wrote this book, and what they said was, design is problem solving, programming, in particular architectural programming, is problem seeking. So the question is, are you trying to find a problem, or are you trying to solve a problem? And I see this with architects, and always this discussion, that some architects will only take really challenging <coughs> problems, right? If it's a, a, a normal house, they won't do it. What they want to do is they want to build this, this, uh, this beautiful structure on the side of a mountain that doesn't fall off, right? They're looking to that. They want to build it under a waterfall. That's the sort of thing. They're looking for problems to solve. They're problem seeking as opposed to um, design, which is problem solving. So this it reflects back in with the four types of errors I had said, right? Solving the wrong problem. And so architecture, in the way that I think about this, and I know this is universal, architecture for me, if I had to define it, in the physical space, I'd say architecture is about dividing up spaces and design is about filling in the spaces. And that's just my personal way of doing it. Um, we have Riddle um, in 1971 publishing some principles of design for the Kinkle system. And in this 1971, it says under context C, design configuration D will lead to performance P. This looks a lot like a pattern language formulation. But it's 1971, right? It's before pattern language gets published. So maybe Riddle and he are talking, Riddle and Alexander are talking back and forth together. Yeah, right? Um, Grady Booch um, in IBM has this interesting statement, all architecture is design and not all design is architecture. Max, as a practicing architect, how do you feel about this? Oh, I think that's right. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, actually, what I'm trying to do in my personal practice is I tend to, I, I would say I work in organizational architecture. I tend to work less in organizational design. I can do organizational design, but I'm actually more interested in how organizations are architected and how, how things work together that way. And, and the difference is, is that um, when I design things, I want to design a space in which people work. So we, there's this current discussion about platforms, right? I design platforms. I don't design the applications on the platforms. I'm working on the platforms themselves. And, and that, that distinction is helpful. But I find that people, when they, when they come into this, and they talk about architecture and design, um, Alexander, because he actually went all the way through and built the stuff, he was doing both. You know, uh, and so if you are using pattern language, are you using it for architectural purposes or are you using it for design purposes? And I'll tell you that Grady Booch is an architect in IT, right? If the, he can code, but that's not what he gets paid to do. He's paid as an architect. So he tries to put in, he tries to put in those large decisions that people can make the smaller decisions later and not be constrained. Okay, second idea. Wicked problems. Okay, so we have wicked problems. Now, there's a strong connection between uh, Riddle and Churchman uh, because in 1967, and this is published in Management Science, he actually has an article that says, Professor Horst Rizzle has suggested that the term wicked problems refer to the class of social system problems. Social system problems, specifically. And it, and it isn't until later that Riddle actually publishes uh, within the urban, um, uh, urban center that he's working, a working paper that is cited, uh, because you actually don't see it published in journals, per se. Uh, but in 1970, he started working on issues of element of information systems with issue-based information systems, and the question is, how is he approaching planning then? 
And what he does is that he creates this idea uh, of elements, and the elements are topics, issues, questions of facts, positions, arguments, and moral problems. So, as opposed to taking a pattern language approach, which is more descriptive, he is structuring something into a tree and says, here's an issue. Associated with the issue, you have the pros and you have the cons. So any political debate, right? You try to take those different sides. Now, we could do this in pattern language. You may not do it, but you stop and think about it. What kind of problem are you trying to solve? Now, um, this could be the way you structure forces. You could structure forces of pro and con and use argumentation schemes. Um, and do it formally, and as opposed to doing it intuitively or conceptually, right? So that's a different approach. Um, 1973 is when they get the uh, dilemmas and the wicked problems actually published. That's more cited. But if you follow up on the work, uh, 1980 he publishes APIS, an argumentative planning information system, and this was a Berkeley working paper. Uh, from there, you go to 1987, and you have G. Ibis, which is uh, Jeff Coughlin, and now you're starting to get into the PC revolution. Right? So how is it that you could actually structure knowledge within a computer when you've got not mainframes, but now the graphical user interfaces? So the idea that Horace Riddle had got extended into hypertext, um, then uh, it got uh, developed into a, a software product in uh, Compendium. Compendium was developed at the Open University in the UK. So in 2003, they have 15 years on from Jai Ibis. So what did they learn over 15 years? And now, in 2012, they took the product that was um, developed at the university, and it, it's now open source. And it's, it's a project that is on its own. It's not funded very well, I don't think. But the software is available if someone wants to pick it up and develop it. Now, this takes a completely different approach to planning and problem solving. You know, could we bring that into the pattern language community? We could. Do we want to? We'll have a discussion. Because, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? David, I, I'm going to uh, okay. dash out in five minutes. Sure. I just wanted to re-emphasize the basic understanding of the patterns was that these are not wicked problems. So, I use this example in the talk. You, you walk into a room and there's a window only on one side of the It causes a problem for everybody in the same way. It doesn't make any difference where you're from, how old you are. Now that could clearly be wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to re-emphasize that solid concept. It's very helpful. Good. The If that's a real problem, then we were confident that we came up with a real solution. It wasn't, uh, it may have been approximate, and we asked for people to improve on that solution. Maybe we only had 50% of the solution, but we felt that we were headed towards solidity. And I think that's helpful too, because uh, Churchman and Horace, it was always against these guys. Mm. I asked Horst to be on my committee. He said, Max, you do not want me on your committee. He, he did me a great favor by saying, you're just asking for trouble. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I'm only trying to clarify that one point. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, because, because, as I said, Purple Sock has social change in the title. And it's like, okay, so we're taking something that was not intended, and not explicit, and we're saying we want to solve it, and we actually have another entire view on this. I think so. When I write patterns now, the, the problem, the core problem, like, oh, if you have one, uh, sometimes on one side, is yes. one statement, and then you have the problem of how to solve, to fix this. So that is that maybe is the wicked. Sometimes it is a wicked. Yeah, that right. The other way. Right. And as a practicing architect, you have to come up with other ways, mm -hmm. which 
you, you can't put another window here because I've got rooms on both sides. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put a skylight up here which will light that wall. So I mean, constantly we're coming up with partial solutions because we can't do the simple thing. I, mm, I understand this, but especially at the conference, I would expect us to work mainly on the key problems. And this is what I find so interesting in Alexander's work in the nature of order of Jabber, because he's not talking uh, only about generative systems, he's talking about generative living systems. Are generate enlightenment, enlightenment, and this is, by definition, so to speak, a negative problem. At least the work I'm doing, I didn't know the definition of negative problem, but if I apply what I'm doing to the definition, then yes, yes, check, 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 and I still can use a patent approach as generating. Partial generating. I, I I don't dare to say solutions now. <laughs> <laughs> what was the alternative to solution? Oh, okay, we will use inter intervention. Intervention. Yes. Generating intervention that makes sure the living system will generate more wholeness or more enlightenment. And, and uh, for me, there's no contradiction between what you are saying in the world of architecture uh, uh, and of objects and what the, the work we are doing in the world of social change. And social change by definition has to do with the problems. I agree. But uh, and we I'm an architect. I deal with objects. I made a point, I mean, one of the other conferences and uh, one of the other sessions, and there was this discussion of how wholeness and the, the, uh, the life in things depended on your emotions. And I uh, disagreed. I said, no, 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 no. I said, the, the life in an object is in the object and that we have to uh, approach it as we are. Sometimes I come and I'm uh, not in a good mood. And I look at the object and I say, yeah, I'm not open to it. Or other times I come and I'm overexcited and I say, oh, this is the most fantastic thing. But I think this idea of the life in objects, the cheat in objects, stands by itself and if I'm clear, free, open, I can see it and experience it. But it doesn't change. So in that sense, again, it's not a wicked problem. It's real. It's reality. And, it's, and we are either more or less able to see it. Now, I made this point, and uh, I didn't escape very safely. But I tossed it in there. That's what I did out of the nature of order. But if we're thinking about society and social, social change as a wicked problem, a wicked then problem. There, there wouldn't be any uh, possibility to improve and to find solutions. Of course not. It's uh, a completely to, to different kind of development. I don't understand why. The idea is that. There is no answer in wicked uh, problems. Yeah. No, there is. There is number no three in the definition. Exactly. Yeah. It's just not a true yeah. or right. It's just a good or bad. And I think. So, so the idea is that you can move forward and you should move forward. Yeah. But let's say you have an ultimate solution. No. Yeah, it is, you have a solution and then you have another solution. Yeah. Intervention. It's Intervention. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's the good thing. Yeah. No solution. Yeah. Uh, the problem in here, I agree with Max, is a very simple one. Keep the water, not get away, and take it somewhere else. Right. But you can achieve some in other ways. And that, I think, where the, well, some wickedness comes in. How do I shape the, 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 the bottom? 
So there, could, there are different ways. And this is where the forces come. And this is where the, I think the wickedness comes in. Because, well, I can identify the, the problem of, oh, the water gets, gets bad if it's not sealed. It, it also, uh, the, the, it's, it's not very easy to transport. You spoil the water and all these kind of things. Or if, if you have to wear the water on your head, as some countries do, it's really heavy. So, so all these kind of things come in as well. And, and I think this battle, as simple as it is, Solves all the right. problems. This, I, then I did a bad job. An object can have more or less of this quality. Yeah. This has less. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I didn't mean that. Yes. But I say yes. that yes. every once in a while we find objects which are beautiful. And they have reached a certain level of wholeness. And that level is independent of our, our moods and our, even our culture. Crazy idea, but that's where it is. I think the point of this battle is a nice example because it actually does solve the problem. Why is this one not beautiful? And I think there, you can argue why it's not beautiful. It does uh, change the light in, in a bad way, it's not really feeling nice. It's, even if you drink out of it, it's not a nice feeling on your lips as compared to a nice uh, um, glass bottle that also gives more value to what is in there. So this is really like oh, something disposable. Thing. So there are many reasons why, why this is not a nice yes. bottle. Yes. Let's continue our bottle of water. Later. I yes. have a okay, okay, I understand. This yes. has been very, very nice. Yes, yes, thank you. So, uh, I'm going I'm to lose most of my audience, unfortunately. <laughs> we have to continue the workshop in, in, in the pre-session. Yes. And then we will see you next week. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, we may have to have a birds of a feather. I could do this as a birds of a feather session in Vancouver. Okay. So, we should do that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we're only up to number two of seven on uh, wicked problems. <laughs> so number three of seven, um, systems approach. So um, the systems approach, if you go back to 1956, um, Kenneth Bolden had this idea of general systems theory as the skeleton of science. Uh, and so systems is a way that you approach the world, uh, starting off with clockworks and mechanisms, and then you go up to biological systems, social systems, supernatural systems, these sorts of things. So, uh, there's different categories of systems, but they're all systems. So in the systems communities, we're trying to bridge those, uh, where you uh, recognize that social systems have properties that biological systems do not. Uh, there are different types of systems, it's okay. There are some properties that are the same, so they're different, that's fine. Uh, in 1971, uh, so this is around the same time that uh, Alexander is doing the beginning of the CES, you have the design of requiring systems. Uh, now, inquiry is an activity which produces knowledge. So, the, this would relate much later into knowledge management sorts of questions. But when you're talking about knowledge, this links in with Riddle's work. Because if you are trying to design an intervention, then how do you know what you are designing as an intervention work or doesn't work? Right? Uh, and so, in that, he has five ways of approaching a system. Um, analytic, deductive, inductive, consensual. Uh, I can write them for you actually. But these are the of time. So, uh, so the inquiring systems. We have inductive, consensual. We have analytic, deductive. We have um, multiple realities. We have dialectic. And then we have uh, multiple perspectives. And for short, we'll do multiple perspectives dialectic. Okay. So the way that we normally work through the design of acquired systems uh, I usually talk about this in terms of how do we know the world is round or flat. So, inductive consensual, what we do, if all of us in this room agree that the world is flat, the world is flat. 
That's the way the inquiry system works, because we agree. Analytic deductive, what we do is create a scorecard, we go out and survey people, do people believe this, do people believe that, then you vote on it, and, and we, that, whatever the majority has, and that must be correct. Multiple realities, this is uh, Kantian, and so you're now working on experience, and what it says is only a person knows inside their head, right? So you have the model, and you have the data, and the model and the data cannot be separated. This Which one says you can make the data Pardon? That's not true. So this is Kant? Multiple, multiple, multiple realities. This is number, so it's uh, one, two, three, four, five. So, um, so number three is Kant. So this is based off experience, right? Yeah. So based off experience, you have a model inside your head, you have the data inside your head. Uh, because the first two are objective. And when you start getting down to the third, now you're dealing with subjective reality. Uh, dialectic. The way that you'll, you'll actually generate knowledge, because it's an inquiry system, is to have debate. So one person will argue black, another person will argue white. It's not about the arguing black or white, it's about people understanding gray. But the people who are the debaters, the function of the debaters is actually to represent the white and the black. They're not supposed to talk about gray, they're supposed to actually do this. So you see this in parliamentary systems. Uh, in Canada we have the government and we have the opposition. The purpose of the opposition is to oppose, which means that if the government is on the left, the opposition is on the right. If the government moves right, the opposition moves to the left. It is their job to oppose. It doesn't matter whether they're left or right. It is the opposition that's important. The problem with the dialectic is that only the person observing the debate gets to see gray. And so the idea of multiple perspective dialectic is take all of these, wrap all these together, and create a multiple perspectives dialectic so everyone can see gray. If everyone gets to argue black, everyone gets to argue white, and then you do that. So the, the lesson for um, the pattern language community is that I see a lot of struggles about is this a good pattern, is this a not, pattern, uh, not a good pattern. And it tends to be objective, which is that someone would say, well, you know, we did it three times, and it seemed to work, and people seem to think it's a good pattern, so therefore it's a good pattern. But there are alternative ways of working through that would challenge that, and one of them is dialectic. And, and so when you move more towards riddle, then you're starting to deal much more with subjective and starting to say, well, in order to surface a lot of the issues, we need to work through it in debate. So that, that's one of the fundamental work. It's not all, the only thing in the systems community that we have, but if we point through this thread, um, then that's when you see, and I quoted before, systems approach its enemy, with politics, morality, religion, or aesthetics, you now end up with those perspectives trying to debate in different ways. Uh, this comes through into um, the actual techniques for this, challenging strategic planning assumptions. That's what I want to do in the Vancouver talk, uh, at PLOP. Um, you have reflection on systems and models 1986, where you start adding in purpose to that. And then you have uh, 2004, uh, Jerry Rabbit's talking about the post global science precaution. And this has to deal with uh, science. Um, so in particular, uh, the thing that he was arguing against then is when you start dealing with um, major disasters, you're talking about nuclear power, these sorts of issues, is what sort of inquiry are you going to have? Because if you're relying on scientists, then you're saying that experts are the ones that will help us with science. But at a certain point, if you're dealing with a post-normal problem, like should we have nuclear power or not have nuclear power, then citizens should engage. And you should be able to have citizens speaking out and entering into the debate, not just the scientists doing it. So as we deal with some science and, and climate change and these sorts of issues, you end up much more with that sort of, uh, of direction. But there is this path that kind of happens through this um, in the systems community that um, is known there. And the pattern language community doesn't really know about it um, so much. Now, um, Hayo, I was talking to Hayo Nice, he actually took courses with Churchman. So he, he's had some of this stuff exposed to him, but he's not teaching it exactly, right? It's not his focus right now. So again, we have the knowledge between the professors and the graduate students. Um, yeah? I guess perhaps a little bit too far for me, but yeah. um, can you again explain the difference between four and five and half? Where would you locate this yeah. thinking? And with who would be a main author of five? 
Okay, so and dialectic, I guess you, you talk about Hegel, right, Marx? Hegel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this is uh, Edgar Singer. Uh, yeah. And and Singer was Churchman's PhD supervisor. So there you have tie, right? So this is actually called a Singerian acquired system. And and you have interesting ties through that. Um, uh, Rafael Ramirez is a professor who graduated um, from uh, Russ Acoff's program. Russ Acoff was Churchman's student, and uh, he was a scenario planner. So uh, Rafael Ramirez is well known for Shell, working at Shell, having the scenario planning stuff. And now he's a professor at Oxford and runs the Oxford Futures um, Forum. And so uh, because I know the statistics community, I had him speak at, um, at my conference, and I asked him a question. Uh, do you use the system thinking work in your scenarios? He says, absolutely. I said, how is that? And he says, scenario building is a Sagarian inquiring system. And David, you are the only person who understands what that means. Again, again, scenario building is? Is a Sagarian inquiring system. So when Raphael, when Raphael builds, when Raphael does scenario planning, he does it this way. But most people, when they do scenarios, they do it one of these ways. Right? So you, you have someone in the systems community who, who's teaching this, actually understands it, but in order to get to that level, you have to do the philosophy, unfortunately, behind it. So, so, so that's the level. So when he literally said, David, you were the only person who understands what that means, is because I understand a Sagarian inquiry system. We want to have scenarios where people are, you have black and white, but everyone gets to argue black and white. So I'll have you argue black, I'll have you argue white, then switch. But you have to stay on that, on that position, and then you can observe someone else. And the way you learn is by observing other people debate. You never learn from being in the position of being a debater. So you have to be an observer and a debater. Everyone should be an observer and a debater. And when you do scenario planning, in the ultimate systems approach, that's the way you should be doing it. But people don't understand that, and so um, they, they, and they do shortcuts. And so it's a difference of level, you know, how well you're doing this. So if we were to design the ultimate pattern language system, would you get a Singarian inquiring system, a multiple perspectives level five Singarian inquiring system? And in effect, in this room we just did, we've lost unfortunately some of the people now, but Max was there. And so he's saying specifically pattern language was for not wicked problems. And that's something that, you know, now we can take forward and say, okay, if it wasn't, then what do we need to do to pattern language to make it so it is useful? Yeah. Okay. But he doesn't seem to be interested in that question. No, no. He, 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 he is. Yes, I know. I am too. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the history of pattern languages in software development, uh, which caused uh, Agile. Um, and so, 1994, you have Ward Cunningham starting off on C2 Wiki. So the the function that people, most people don't seem to um, have appreciated this, that the, the reason that Wiki was invented was specifically for pattern language. And the issue is that when you have all these things going on at the same time, that patterns connect to each other in a language form, then you have to manage hyperlinks, which today we go, oh yeah, Wikipedia, hyperlinks, no big deal. But back in 1994, no one knew how to do that. So they started working on it, and, um, and the original stuff was there, and then they moved off it. Um, 1995, the publishing of the Divine Patterns book, right? Which I have in patch because it was not part of the Hillside movement. It kind of joined on the Hillside movement when it started rising. And the Hillside Group in 1995 had their first meeting and they published the Proceedings, uh, Languages of Program Design. So Jim Copley and, and uh, Schmidt are the editors of that. Uh, now, actually, an important book that I think is quite helpful uh, is um, uh, Richard Gabriel, Patterns of Software, Tales from the Software Community. Um, now, as I said before, Gabriel was working at Sun Microsystems with Bill Joy, and so he was the first person in software to be working with Christopher Alexander, exactly. And, and while he is a long history in computer science, he is a poet. And he studied his master's degrees in poetry. And so the way that he runs the workshops and the way the workshops at Plot are designed are as poetry workshops. 
You write a pattern like every Friday poem. Which is not necessarily how I would do it, but I respect that's a way of doing it, and he does it very, very well, and I participated in that. Um, but within that book, um, he actually goes through questions, like there's a, a, a short chapter, they're all short chapters, on quality without a name. And he discusses the issues about what is quality without a name, and is it something that you believe in or don't believe in? And that's where you end up with these discussions. Well, why are you using pattern language if you don't believe in quality without a name? And it's because, well, as Alexander changed it, this idea of order, and there's other things that come in. Uh, in 2001, we have the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. Now, if you look at those people that were on that manifesto, there were 17 signatories to that, saying we want to develop software in a different way. Uh, the overlap between that and the people in the software community is pretty big. You've got all these people in there, and it's like you've got the same names. And they are, in effect, the people that are behind the Agile software movement and the um, Scrum methodology. Right? So, uh, 2004, Copeland Harrison Organizational Patterns of Agile Software Development. This is not about software. This is about work organization. So Scrum and the work that he's working on is fundamentally not about the software. It's about how you organize to build software together. But you could actually use it, the same method to do any project. So now we're in, we compare this to uh, Horse Riddle, and Horse Riddle is talking about planning. Well, is planning something you do like once a year, and then you come back and revisit it? Or is it something that you do incrementally, like agile software development, where you work on stuff going along? Right? So all this is influenced, and this is all influenced much more by timeless way of building than it is by pattern language. Um, in 2008, Doug Schuler published Liberating Voices, and this is about communications. Um, it's, it's actually a very complete pattern language on communications. He did this part of the Public Sphere project. All of the content is online. Um, he's recently published a, a patterns deck. And this is focused on social change. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it should be this conference regularly. Um, in 2010, Jim Copeland uh, started uh, Scrum Talk. So this, this is a result of the organizational patterns work and leading on from that. It's a very active group. It's approved by both the Hillside group, so all the pattern language heritage, and the Scrum Alliance, and they're very active. And so if you're working on teams and trying to organize, they've got a good pattern language, and, and you know, they work through their process. And um, arguably, it is the most successful pattern language project. Um, it, it is the longest, certainly, running since 2010. They have the most number of content, the most uh, number of publishing, uh, and you're definitely in the sphere of working together in collaboration. In 2012, a group in Oregon created the Group Works Card Deck, and the Group Work Card Deck is about how you run meetings better, right? So all these have, are not associated with pattern language per se in the original architectural space. We're now moving into other spaces, and there's a lot of work that we can draw on there. Okay. I'm going to lean a little bit more on... Um, on the systems theory and some of the developments that have been happening, and a lot of this is tied to the work that I've been doing because I'm trying to generate a uh, different direction. Um, and I'm going to go back to um, Gregory Bates of 1972. So now we're kind of back at Berkeley again. He's actually at the University of California, Santa Cruz, so he's down the road. But um, Bateson was actually a regent of the University of California. So he's over all the university systems of California, including Berkeley. Um, and he wrote this idea about uh, ecology of mind and how do ideas interact, what are the limits, and um, I, it took me a long time, I, this is not the direction I came in from the systems community when I started entering in 1998, and I've always found Bateson difficult to understand, and, um, and through, through more recent research, I've actually figured out a way to use it, and what, the reason that I've been oriented this way is I've been teaching in design schools, and so, um, and I'm really from a management school perspective, so how do I teach designers as opposed to teaching management? Uh, in 1979, we have uh, James Gibson, The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. Um, so, what fields do you work in? You work in? The cons. I'm working on the cons. Okay, oh. and what do you work on? Uh, I've, I would say between Bateson and uh, I, call it, I call it like culture hacking. Okay, so culture hacking. Okay, good. Okay. So, 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 this is actually somewhat more comfortable because what I would say is that this starts heading into the computer field, but um, Gibson 
in the ecological approach to visual perception. I was trying to understand where he was coming from, and he, um, it ends up in the work of Tim Ingold. Um, if, you, if you're a YouTube fan, just start searching on Tim Ingold, you can watch the video, he's a great lecturer. Uh, but he's the one that made clear to me, trying to understand what was happening through uh, Bateson and Gibson. So you have the idea of ecology, what do they mean by ecology in this sense? Uh, and the best explanation is through Gibson, through ecological approach, because what he was looking at was um, an alternative to behavioral psychology. And there's this great book that's called, um, in, in effect, you, you, I don't want to know what's inside your head, I want to know what your head is inside. So looking at the systems approach, behavioral psychology, in effect, assumes that they're looking inside your head. And they're trying to figure out what's going on inside your head. Whereas an ecological approach, ecological psychology, says, I'm not focused on what's inside your head. I'm focused on the environment around you. Right? And so in that respect, we're talking about Bates and an ecology of mind. We're talking about what's around as opposed to what's inside. Uh, in in uh, 1997, uh, you start talking about interaction design. And uh, this is a shift um, around the time Macintoshes are becoming in, graphical user interface. So computers are not what they used to be. It's not a batch process where you take punch cards and run them through a machine and get an output anymore. It's something you interact with through a visual interface, right? And this is the rise of interaction design. And in 1999, you have Don Norman uh, publishing work on affordances. And he's now, he was, at this point, he was a, a fellow at Apple. And so you have all this work going on about interactions. And this is a shift in philosophy now from the work that we have pattern language. Um, so unfortunately, since we've lost Max, but Max is pretty clear about his position, he's talking about the quality in this bottle of water. And what we're saying is that there's actually an alternative philosophy which says the quality is not in the bottle of water. The quality is between me and the bottle of water. An affordance, the best way to describe an affordance, is a doorknob. A doorknob is on a door. A doorknob affords you the ability to push or pull the door, right? Uh, if you do not recognize the doorknob, then it's not an affordance, because you don't perceive it. So you could start working through, well, you know, is, will most people recognize the doorknob, or they don't recognize it, or how do you design the doorknob so people actually know that it actually is designed that you can push? And so if it's a plate, that means you push the door, as opposed to a doorknob that you can pull the door. These sorts of things start coming out with visual cues. Now, in 2000, um, Tim Ingold published a book, um, Perception of the Environment, and in 2011, he extended that with Being Alive. And that takes the work um, of Bateson and Gibson and extends it into um, interaction and um, also materials, which I find very helpful for teaching designers. Because um, one of the things that um, uh, um, Mac was talking about was that architects and designers traditionally have done products, but what's happened recently is they're moving towards services. And if you're moving towards services, services are by definition interactive. <coughs> so we can use a metaphor of a bus versus a taxi. A bus will take a route even if there's no passengers on it. A taxi requires co-production because when you get into the car, the taxi driver asks, where do you want to go? If you don't tell the taxi driver where you're going to go, you're not going anywhere. Or he could drive you around the circles, but really that's not what a taxi is about, right? So this idea of interactive is, is new. Now, the pattern language community, and this is where we're starting getting into debates, is the quality in the thing or is the quality in the interaction is a big, big difference. If you work in a social sense where there's perception, all of a sudden now you've got this big issue and you start actually discussing it. So um, the way that I handle this and what's in the, in the Perl paper from last year is I'm all moving towards interaction, but then when I write my patterns, my patterns are all verbs, not nouns. Oh, well, same for me. Yes, there you go, right? No, I, I think that the, 
I, I, I even started to do some criteria of how to write a good pattern in exactly. social change. Yes. And it need, it's not all words, it needs to contain a word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My pattern starts with a word. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's so you're consistent with what I've been doing. But getting that change in practice, explaining why it is you want to do that, it's fundamentally because it's interactive as opposed to being about things. So for architects, okay, I understand, I respect what they do. Working in social change, we might be doing something different. Oh, I missed I miss, I miss another talk. I wanted to go. Okay. <laughs> I already missed it, but I will go to the next one. So okay, okay. But this is so, so good and so interesting. Okay. Um, okay, hierarchy theory. So hierarchy theory, uh, again, more extended to the systems theory. I'll move up. Let me, uh, that, that's a projector voice, so... Uh. Oh, okay, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah me, me too, because at the end there's another one. Yeah, okay, also, so I'll, I'll do this and I'll wrap this up. Uh, yeah, you can just okay. run through it, or if, if you like, if, you have, if it's below your quorum, I'm happy to like... Uh, oh, no, it's okay. ...wind down as well. It's okay. So, um, uh, so in hierarchy theory, um, hierarchy theory uh, is handled architecture implicitly because now we are talking about things contained inside each other. And we're talking about bigger and smaller levels of scale. So in 1982, uh, hierarchical perspectives for ecological complexity, they do it in ecology. Um, and you know the book, uh, How Buildings Learn? Which I is worked under friend, uh, Frank Duffy, so... Yeah, yes. Same tradition, yeah. Exactly, okay, so yes. Yeah, the extension of Frank Duffy is actually cited in the book, right? So that is um, Stuart Brand taking the work they've done in ecology and extending it in, into, uh, into that book. Um, now that has come, gone into the panarchy literature and, uh, and through um, into the social ecological systems. So all the work on sustainability from the Stockholm Resilience Center follows through this chain, yep. right? So um, it's all hierarchy. Now in building architecture, of course, they do this sort of stuff, but you know, if we're working in social change, then you start asking what level of scale and how that all works together. So systems approach helps here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, the last perspective, uh, and we may wrap up because we may kind of want to go somewhere else. So um, in 1994, uh, Richard Norman and Raphael Ramirez write this article called Designing Interactive Strategy. And now the idea of interaction comes in because people didn't understand it before, the idea that, that you would have interaction between the parties in the organization. And they have the idea of co-production that comes out, which is from systems, um, through, uh, um, they, they have the, uh, the original one was, um, how do you create an oak tree? You co-produce between the water and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, and then you have the offerings, which is products, services, and relationships. Um, that's trickled through recently to um, dominant logic and marketing with service and review, and this idea of service science. So this is all interactive as we move from a product economy to a service economy, or industrial economy to services economy. And so this is something that the pattern language community might consider bringing in as well. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so should we wrap up, or do we have a private conversation? Well, I, how, how, how much, uh, this is but the last of the seven dialectics, that's, right? that's a seven, and okay. so from, from there, it's just kind of open discussion. Cool, so. uh, I'm happy to sit down and chat for a little, I have lots of questions and okay. thoughts, but yeah. uh, if you want to wrap up, that's also okay. Yeah, so I, I think we'll wrap up the, the formal workshop, yeah. mm -hmm. we'll turn off the recorder, yeah, we can and sit we'll just have a talk. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Thank you, this, this has been quite uh, very useful. Okay, thanks.